So, today we're going to be talking about the lasso. Yes, this is, I'm pretty sure this is John Wayne, but wrong lasso, we're going to talk about the mathematical lasso. So, the lasso is this equation, essentially. Your goal is that you have an objective function you're trying to minimize. All of machine learning is just minimizing something, and it depends how you're going about minimizing it. So who here has seen the lasso? All right, so a lot of you hopefully like this. Hopefully a lot of you see this. Basically, the left-hand side is ordinary least squares. You minimize that, you have linear regression. We've been doing that for a few hundred years. The right-hand side is a penalty term. The, it's the L1 norm of the betas. That is the sum of the absolute values of the betas times this lambda, that's your penalty term. We could also do the ridge, but today we're just going to focus on the lasso. Similar solutions for both, but just the lasso today. Geometrically, we're talking about the blue diamond on the inside. So that the, has sharp edges, and that's what it gives you the singularities, which gives you variable selection. Similar, to, it lets you do variable selection that's actually, you know, kosher to do. So we're going to start with the data, because without data, what are we showing here? And for our example, we're going to use a, just a portion of the Ames housing data. There's more of it, but it's not on the screen right now. Normally, there'd be like a whole bunch of little red dots clustered around the town of Ames. It's, you can't see it, unfortunately, here. And we're using this because it's available. But also because it's not a lot of rows, but it does have a lot of columns for the number of rows, which is where the lasso excels. That's what it was invented for. It was actually invented for genomics when you had 5,000 columns, but only 1,000 rows. So this is really great for high dimensional data. Getting the data is pretty easy. You use the Ames housing package, make Ames, and then you split the data using the R sample package, and you get into a training and testing split. The data has a lot of information about the sale price of the, of the house. You have the latitude and longitude, square feet, quality, a bunch of different qualities. Quality of the house, quality of the kitchen, quality of the basement, all this good stuff. So let's do some data prep. There's an old joke, I'm sure everyone's heard it here, so I'm going to give you a groaner. 80% of the time is spent doing data preparation. The other 20% of the time is complaining about data preparation. <laughs> so we're going to start off like you do anything else in R for modeling with a formula. You can see we have many, many variables, lots of them. Sale price will be our outcome variable, our response. And we're going to regress that on all these other input variables. We're going to be using this a lot of times, so instead of retyping it, we just save it as a variable. That's new to a lot of people. They, didn't, they don't realize you could save a formula as a variable, but it's a really handy thing to do. We're going to take this formula and put it into a recipe. So we're going to take this recipe, which is like the new cutting edge, cool, hip way of defining your design matrix. Instead of relying on the old semantics of a formula, which I know we are using a formula to get started. We didn't have to. But this sort of makes it more explicit what you're going to do. Like, for instance, step other, we're taking any uh, categorical variable that has many levels, and the least frequent of them, grouping them into other. We are getting rid of any variables of zero variance, which means they don't provide really any information. Centering and scaling all the numeric variables and creating dummy variables. And in this case, we are not dropping the baseline. If there are k levels, we are getting k dummy variables. Because with the lasso, you don't need to worry about collinearity. And we're adding an intercept explicitly, because if you don't, the model might not give it to you. After you defined our recipe, you then go and prep the recipe. You get it ready. And this is going to do things like calculate the mean and standard deviation of each of the numeric columns. It's going to figure out what levels of the categoricals are available. This way, it can be applied the same way from the training data to the testing data. And I'd like to see model.matrix do that. This is much better. And by saying retain, that means when we want to use it for training data, it's much faster. So there are many ways we can fit the lasso. And we're going to look at a bunch of them today because we can. People who know me know that I like to give my talks like, let's do it in R because we can, and just you know, do everything. So first up, GlimNet. Yes, it's pronounced GlimNet. I used to pronounce it GLMNet. Then I got a lunch with the, the author of the package, and he said, no, it's pronounced GlimNet. And I've been crushed ever since. <laughs> so came up with Hasty, Chibshani, and Friedman, like the godfathers of machine learning. And GlimNet was written in 73 lines of Fortran code. That's insane how little code that took, right? 
And it's amazing. So we start off with our matrices. We get our x input matrix, our y output matrix. And for the input matrix, we're going to use a DGC matrix. That's a sparse matrix. The benefits are it takes up less space in memory, but it also computes faster. Sparse matrices have faster computation. So we take our prepped recipe object and we juice it. And this is how we get the training data out of there. Yes, you're going to be juicing and baking. Thank you, Max. So we're going to be doing this. We don't have to do the calculations again. That's the benefit of juicing. We get our x and y. We call glimnet. One line of code to call glimnet to give us penalized regression. Give it the x, give it the y. We're going to explicitly say it's a Gaussian model. And alpha equals 1, which means it's explicitly saying it's a lambda. Don't include the intercept because our design matrix have that, has that already. And don't, include, don't standardize the data because we've already standardized everything in recipes. One line of code to fit an entire path of regressions. So when you do GlimNet, it doesn't fit one model. It fits roughly 100 models, one for each lambda. And it ends up looking like this. Each line is a coefficient. And for a given value of lambda, it tells you the value of that coefficient. Further away from the zero line, the bigger the impact. As you increase lambda, you're increasing the penalty. The variables get shrunk down. And eventually, some of them go straight to zero, and they've not been selected. That's your variable selection. And we've all seen this plot if you've done GlimNet. And you're all like, how do I read this? Which one is which? There is a label argument, but it's nearly useless. So fortunately, there's an interactive version in the coef plot package. You can call coef path, and it will give you an interactive visualization. If I wasn't giving a presentation, I could hover over this, and it will uh, pop up a legend showing you the values. And you could even zoom in and pan around and see the different values of your graph here. I think it's a big improvement over the base R plotting. And let's say out of your 100 lambdas, you've decided on one of them, and you want one. You can call coef plot and see the point estimates for each of the coefficients. This is showing the point estimates for a lambda of 0.004. I chose that because I did cross-validation. I did it a bunch of times. It seemed to work the best. Notice there are no confidence intervals, because confidence intervals be damned. <laughs> no, I actually like confidence intervals. I think they're really, really important. But so much of machine learning doesn't include them, so we're stuck without them. Um, you can't bootstrap this, because it's a biased estimator, so the bootstrap doesn't work. You need an adjusted bootstrap. Though Tipsharani did put out a package recently that lets you get confidence intervals, but it takes more computational power than fitting the lasso does. All right, so that was GlimNet. Let's move on to XGBoost, the darling of Kaggle competitions. <laughs> so similar to GlimNet, it takes sparse matrices. You give it an X, a sparse X, and a dense Y. But you have to compute this XGB.D matrix object, and this keeps the X and Y together. And you can tell when they built this, they were thinking of classification, because they call the input, input variable data and the output label as if the output isn't part of your data. And they call it a label as if you're not going to do regression. But you can totally do regression. So after you get this special object created, you go ahead and call xgb.train. You give it the special object holding the x and y. And the key line here is the booster. By default, xgboost fits a boosted tree. But by setting to GB linear, it's boosting a linear model. Now, when Hasty and Tipsharani came up with gradient boosted machines, it was a machine. Any model could be boosted. So we're going to boost the linear model. But what we're doing is we're setting alpha. It's a different alpha now. They had to change all the names. So while GlimNet has a lambda and then alpha is a mixing parameter, in XGBoost, alpha is the, lambda, is the lasso penalty. Lambda is the ridge penalty. So we're going to use alpha of 0.004 to set up a lasso regression, and we use a objective of linear regression, and we boost it 20 times. When you do that, you get a coef plot like this. Seems like a similar model to before. However, this shows you all the zero variables. So there's a little trick of coef plot where you can say, don't plot it, filter out everything, and then plot it again using coef plot. So coef plot can take data frames in addition to models. It's a little bit of effort, so coef plot's going to be updated so that it's one step. You don't need to use filter in there. So next up is LARS, least angle regression. This is one of the early functions for doing the lasso, written by Hasty, Tipsharani, and Efron. Bradley Efron, the inventor of the bootstrap. So for this, we need dense matrices. We can no longer use sparse matrices. So again, we use 
juice from the recipes package, and we say composition is matrix. With our dense matrices, we call LARS. This is from the LARS package. Notice it looks very similar to GlimNet. You have your X, your Y, the type is lasso, no intercept, don't normalize. And like lasso, unlike XGBoost, this will fit the entire path of lambdas, not just one of them. And GlimNet actually gets faster when you fit 100 than when you fit one. It's pretty cool. So there is no coef plot function built into this. So we extract the coefficients, we store it as a data frame, we add in our non-existing confidence intervals because we don't get them, and you call coef plot on this constructed data frame. And once again, we are getting similar results as we would hope because we keep fitting the lasso. So then we come to Stan. Asian MCMC. Now we could write this in pure Stan code. We could write all the Stan code of all the blocks. But we're just going to use our Stan arm because it's all built for us. The reason we can use Stan is because the lasso can be interpreted as a Laplace prior. It's not exactly the same that you have to talk about the mode versus the mean, but it's close enough for our purposes that if you put a Laplace prior on your coefficients, you're going to get the lasso. So thanks to this little trick, we can do this. But Stan is written for statisticians, so it uses data frames. So we need to go back to recipes. It's almost identical, except we're not creating dummy variables. We are leaving them as categorical because Stan will take care of that for us. So we create a recipe, and then we juice it. And this time, we say the composition is a tibble. So we've seen sparse matrices, dense matrices, and tibbles, all available thanks to the recipes package. So given this data frame and the formula we created a while ago, we call Stan GLM. And yes, this is GLM, not Glim. We give it the formula, and we give it the data frame, tell it's a Gaussian. And we say the prior is lasso. Now, Stan has a Laplace prior, which we could have used. But then you need to specify the parameter. You need to specify the penalization parameter. And I don't want to do that. By using the lasso prior, it will learn the hyperparameter from the data. So yes, it takes longer, because you have to do MCMC on this, but I don't have to do any variable tuning. I don't have to do hyperparameter tuning. It does it by itself, sort of like cross-validation in GlimNet. So this is really, really awesome. It lets it all happen automatically. So Stan has its own version of coef plot called MCMC intervals, which gives you confidence intervals. We finally got them back for the lasso, thanks to Bayesian statistics. So Bayes to the rescue here. I don't know how to sort it yet. I'm going to have to ask them how to do that. But a nice feature of Bayes is that you, can, you don't need to just get the intervals. You can get the density of your betas. This shows you for each beta, each coefficient, where the mass of it is and where it's most likely and where it's less likely. And I really love the fact that you get an entire distribution, not just the interval. All right. Next up, quadratic programming. Because we can. <laughs> Why not do it? So back to our loss function that we saw before, the sum of squares plus a penalty. We'll get rid of the 1 over 2n because it's a constant, and we rewrite it in matrix notation. The L2 norm of the objective plus the L1 norm of the penalty. This is now an unconstrained quadratic optimization problem. And the lambda is a Lagrange multiplier. We could rewrite this as a constrained optimization, where now it's just the objective function, the sum of squares, subject to the sum of the betas being less than t. And t is inversely proportional to our old lambda. So let's take our objective function and do some matrix arithmetic. You, all we did was took the transpose properly. We did FOIL. Yes, we're FOILing from like middle school. <laughs> it's matrix FOIL. We expanded out. We rearranged some terms. And we get that bottom line there. You get to that bottom line. And you can rewrite this in quadratic optimization notation, which looks like this. And the optimizers have slightly different notation. For us, x is our data, and the betas are our, our unknowns that we're trying to solve for. For quadratic, well, optimization people in general, x is the unknown variable that they're solving for. So in our case, we have betas, they have x's. So you just need to rewrite it that way. In order to rewrite it that way, we need to do a little mathematical trick. And we, need, we, we say the positive side of beta minus the negative side of beta. 
And that's a trick. If you do the beta plus minus beta minus, it gives you beta. And by doing it this way, I know I'm going through this really quickly, because it's a 20 minute talk. By doing it this way, you, if you didn't do it this way, you would have to have two to the p constraint formulas, and that's too many to do. So by splitting up into the negative portion and the positive portion, we dramatically reduce the number of constraint equations we need, and it will allow us to optimize this quicker. So there's no program to do this automatically, so we need to write our own custom function like this. Now, I took this from uh, this guy, Eric Drysdale, has a wonderful write-up of doing quadratic optimization for the lasso. Essentially, you're computing all those V and X matrices and all those vectors, and then you're fitting a regular linear model to get the upper bounds for the coefficients, and that's sort of what Glimnet does. It computes the dot product between each predictor and the response to figure out the top values. But the, the crux of it here is the bottom, where you do low rank QP, low rank quadratic programming. It's quadratic programming, but since we have sparsity, it needs to be low rank, so it's a special function to do that. We give it all of our matrices and vectors we created with all of our constraints, which I'm not going to walk through right now, and that's our function we can use. We then build our matrices again, thanks to the recipes package, and then we call our function. Like this, one line of code after writing 20 lines of code. <laughs> you give it your x and y, and you give it a t. And the t you would need to tune. I chose 5, and I chose it because it looked good in the pictures. And it converged in 25 iterations. And yes, there is a, um, there's a guarantee how quickly this will converge. I forget the exact number, but there's a guarantee it will converge in like a short amount of time. We get the coefficients, and it looks like this. Nice sparsity. It didn't choose all the variables. It actually did its job. All right, so that was quadratic programming. Back to easier code. TensorFlow. <laughs> TensorFlow is essentially just a generalized matrix algebra library. So it can do linear regression. It's essentially a wrapper around Eigen. That's really what it is underneath the hood. So for TensorFlow, we need dense matrices once again, because it can't do sparse. But also, it can iterate data into memory, so it's not a big deal. We then design our network. And our network consists of one layer. It's the output layer, and it uses a linear activation function. If it's a linear activation function, it's a linear regression, especially since it's one layer. So we give our input, and I chose the kernel regularizer to be L1, lasso. And I chose a, they call it L, our lambda of 0.02, again, because it looked good. You would need to tune these things. And now the weights in a deep learning model are just coefficients from a linear regression. And we're, instead of solving for them using newton raphson we're going to solve with stochastic gradient descent. So our model looks like this, 64 parameters, all the numeric variables plus all the dummy variables plus the intercept. We then compile the model. And if you haven't seen Keras and TensorFlow in R, you don't actually save it back to variable because you modify it in place. We're going to use mean squared error as our loss function. And we're going to use RMS prop as our optimizer. We could have used Adam, but RMS prop was fine. And we have a metric of mean absolute error. And then we train the model. I think Keras took more work even than quadratic optimization. So we give it the X and Y matrix. We do 30 epochs. We choose our batch size of 64, the smaller the better. We use a 10% validation split. We do a early stopping. We do a learning rate adjustment. And we call it TensorBoard. You do all that, and you get your your metrics, how you're doing, and as the epochs increase, you get better and better, and it appears we have not yet started to overfit. So that's a good thing. So now that we have a one-layer model, it's no longer a black box, we get coefficients. You can get that. You get the weights, and if it's one layer, it's a linear model, so you can understand it. It's, it's an interpretable neural net. <laughs> Who would have ever thought you can get that? So we did all the models. Let's very quickly look at performance, because a lot of people think machine learning is just like a game where you try to get the highest score. So we take our test data, and we can no longer juice. Now we bake the test data. And so we bake our data, test data, and we make predictions for each of the models. With the exception of quadratic programming, which is just matrix multiplication, everything, even Keras, uses the predict function. We, each one might be a little different, new x versus new y. Uh, apparently, baking might change the order of the, the variable columns, so that's something that we need to get fixed. 
So I had to do it there. And you have the little things here, but it's all the same. For each of these, we go through, add in the actual values, calculate the residuals, and put them all together as a data frame, allowing us to make this plot. This shows us our actual values versus our predicted values. And ideally, you want them to be as close to the diagonal line as possible. Let's just get the mean squared error for each of these. When we do that, Stan won. Stan was the best. I'm so proud of the Bayesians. <laughs> and XG Boost came in like almost tied with, with Stan, followed by Glimnet, Lars, my quadratic programming model, followed by Keras. Now, I'm not saying any of these are better. I hypertuned more, some more than other, because Glimnet, easy to hypertune. XG Boost, fairly easy. Keras took a little more time. In truth, that Keras model took about 10 seconds to run on this laptop on battery mode. So not terrible, but I didn't spend as much time doing it. So today, we learned Glimnet, XGBoost, Lars, Stan, Quadratic Programming, and Keras. And we did it all with all of these packages. So these slides will be available. You can check out all the packages we use today. So thank you very much.